The Chelsea District Library is pleased to present What's Your Story? A conversation between New York Times bestselling author Kevin Sessoms and serendipity bookstore owner Michelle Tumblr. So here, Kevin, are your two books. Thank you so much for joining us. Are we going to be twinsies? Oh, you look, you've got the older version of this one. <laughs> Oh, oh, you beat me. I don't have that. Who did that? Did you, did you record that? I recorded this and, and you know, I've never listened to it. It was so emotional to record it. I can't imagine. I can't, I've never listened to it. And I know it, it got, it, it was nominated for some big award that Sissy Spacek won. An for, audio award? It was nominated for some big audio book award. Yeah. This is basic for reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, Fanny Flagg for reading one of her books. Amy Sedaris for reading oh one of her books. Oh my goodness. There was another one. But Sissy Spacek won. So, I, so, so my line has always been, if this sissy has to lose to another sissy, <laughs> then To Kill a Mockingbird and Sissy Spacek, I can cop to that. So. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to say congratulations. I mean, they're just amazing, amazing achievements. And uh, for me, you know, when I was done reading, you engage, you engage the reader so much that they really care about you, I think, at the end. And um, so I just need to ask, you know, without probing too much, are you doing okay? Oh, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> No, I'm not. I just lost a, my dog. Oh uh, dear. I I had two two dogs. Well, I know, I know your dogs. They're they're in here. Um, Archie, I lost in San Francisco when I lived in San Francisco. Yeah. And Teddy, at first, at first, I sort of resented Teddy for being the one who was left because he was brought in as a companion to Archie, and. So he was a few, you got him a few years after Archie. Years, yeah. And Arch, Archie and I were, were, were soulmates. We were sort of this, yeah. this, we were this singular, we were, um, we were solitary people, not people, solitary souls who sort of found each other and mm -hmm. shared a space and loved each other. And when we, when I brought Teddy in, we became a family. I'm not gonna cry to start this off. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. We became a family. And um, so he was there to help me through Archie's death. Yeah. And, and during this isolation and during the duration, as I call it, um, he got sick. He had liver failure. Oh. And, so for four weeks, I nursed him uh, alone here in isolation. And I had booked a Wednesday to uh, kill him. That's what we do. We kill them. We don't put them to sleep. We don't, you know, put well, them down. Yeah. And I had booked a Wednesday, and, and on that Tuesday, um, he died in my arms at, sunset, at, su at sunrise. So, and Archie died, died in my arms the day before I was going to kill him. So they both... That's kind of remarkable. Both died in my arms the day mm -hmm. before I was going to have to deal with killing him. And, um, yeah, so I am a cliche, right? I'm a, I mean, I'm an old gay guy who doted on two dogs for 15 years. Yeah. They were presence in my life and um, I've written a lot about it on Facebook I posted a, posted a lot about it but um, it's a kind of grief that you don't know unless you've had dogs and for some of us I think um, that have not been lucky enough to have love or marriage or children in, in our lives they become a repository for the kind of love mm. that, that that is so that we feel like yeah. we're not damaged and that we're able to love this other creature and 
not as damaged as we feel like we are. And then when they die, um, it, it's, it's a special kind of grief for them, but it lances all the grief you carry around in your life. Yeah. And the love for that creature. Yeah. So that when he dies, all that grief just surfaces. And you sob like you just, I mean, yeah. the sobs. Are mm -hmm. So, no, I haven't been okay. No. But I'm finally emerging. And, um, you know, and, you know, all, all of my friends go, you got to get another dog. You got to get another dog. You know, there's a dog. I, and I just, although I find the impulse to say that kind, I also think it's a bit of a cavalier kind. Well, you need to be ready, I think. I'm a dog person. I don't, I gave away two, two dogs. I mean, I loved Archie and Teddy. Mm -hmm. There was something about those two animals. <clears throat> yeah. I'm 64, I'll be 65, you know, in, in less than a year. And I don't know how much time I have left. And do I want to devote my life to another dog and then go through this grief again? And um, <clears throat> Anyway, you asked, I told yes, you. I did. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, you have so many people though rooting for you. I think, you know, I, I hope you have. I hope you feel that. Not just not just on Facebook because people who who read your book, not all of them are on Facebook, and they still, you know, want the very best for you. Thank you. So fame is a huge theme in both of these books. Um, I think in Mississippi Sissy, you know, you've got your chapter titles that actually reflect you know, famous people and writers. And in um, I Left It on the Mountain, you begin with the chapter on the stars and then, you know, the, um, the incident with Madonna and Daniel Radcliffe. And I guess, you know, you use, well, you use famous people in a, month, in a bunch of ways, but in I Left It on the Mountain, you, you're using them to, to kind of pique the, the reader's initial interest because who doesn't want to read a story about Madonna? But what do you say then to, to memoirists, to people who are thinking of writing their own stories who don't know Madonna or don't have these, you know, haven't been to Spain? How, how do they still write an interesting, engaging story? They have to be Madonna. They have to be Daniel Radcliffe. Yes. They have to be the star of, of, of their own lives, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm Vivian Vance. I'm Celeste Holm. I'm the, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the friend dog, you know, I'm not the dog. So in, in, in a strange way, I'm, you know, I'm Ethel Mertz. So I'm Ethel Mertz writing about what it's like to live downstairs from Lucy. Uh, so my suggestion is be, be Lucy. Um, yeah. So it's funny. It seems like the, um, when you write the, those famous, those famous people, so you're kind of, you, you're creating characters, but the reader already has preconceived notions about what those people are like. So for example, if I'm reading about you describing Daniel Radcliffe, I have this kind of mixed up notion that's like half Harry Potter, half, you know, kind of skinny nerdy, like my own notion. And somehow you've got to create your version of that character. So is it harder in a way to write about people who are already famous, do you think? No, uh, it's all, it's been my job. Yes. It's just my job. Yes. Before, before I wrote a memoir, that was my job. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very working class, blue collar uh, attitude about that job. I don't find it glamorous yeah. at all. I think of myself as a truck driver and I haul glamorous cargo. And I get to the deadline when I have to like unload the cargo, when the story has to be delivered. I unload the cargo, I get behind the wheel and I drive the truck with some more cargo in it. I have a very working class attitude about what that job was writing cover stories for Vanity Fair and other magazines because I know where those stories are read. They're mm -hmm. read on airplanes and they're read when you're sitting on the toilet. So I know. <laughs> It's red. So I have a very, very 
artistic. At, I think I'm, I think I am very good at it, and I sort of created a different way to write those profiles. Um, but I also know how it punched the button of my inferiority complex to be a part of a writing stable at a magazine like Vanity Fair for all those years. Yeah. And how there were serious writers and there was the writer who did the cover story on the movie star. And so you never considered yourself a serious writer at that point? Yeah. Oh. No, I didn't. I knew I was good at what I did. I knew, yeah. I, I, knew I sold issues. But I also knew every time Tina Brown or Graydon Carter looked at me, they saw the cudgel with which they were beat over the head by the people they wanted to take them seriously. So mm -hmm. that as serious journalists and serious yeah. magazine editors. So whenever Vanity Fair was criticized, it was criticized for what I did. So when, when they looked at me, I was the weapon used against them. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I'm able to see the lay of, uh, lay of any narrative land and the narrative land of my working life was that. I was the cudgel. Wow. So do you, I mean, now you've written, you've written two really successful memoirs. Do you consider yourself now a serious writer? I always considered myself a serious writer. Yeah. I did not consider myself a serious writer within the context of my truck driving job. I see. Yeah. I, did not. I, I approached each story I did seriously. Yes. But within the context of, of, Van, of the Vanity Fair mm -hmm. soul, mm -hmm. um, I, wasn't, I wasn't considered serious by other people. So is it like a writer with like a capital W? Yeah. yeah I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was the writer with a capital R, you know? <laughs> I lead a writing group here and we, we were doing a discussion about structuring writing and whether or not it should be or could be um, straight chronological or kind of mixed up in, in terms of time jumping. And in Mississippi City, you know, it's basically chronological. This mm -hmm. one, you jump, it's more thematic. I mean, it's somewhat chronological still. Mississippi City isn't that chronological. I mean, it goes from my mother's death to a party for yeah. Eudora Welty. This is, this is her. Oh, look daughter. at that. Um, Eudora Welty. But, but, um, but, you know, even she said that, you know, time is, is more to her a thread, a thread of revelations. Yes. How, that's how she saw time, which is not exactly chronological. Um, no, and in, in I Left It on the Mountain, you really show that. I mean, you it's it's so thematic. Um, there's one, actually, it's the description of when you go and get your, I don't know if it's the first dog or the second, it would be the first dog, when you go get Archie. And so there's the whole chapter about that. And then the next one, Archie isn't in your life at that point, And you say, oh, this is before then. And then you flip back again. So it's thematic. And I wonder... Is that easy to do? I mean, this is something that many of the writers in our group would like to achieve, but it's tricky. Right. There's, a, there's another quote by Miss, Miss Welty, where she says, um, I have to change glasses here, but I'm, I'm old now. Um, <laughs> she says that um, it is our inward journey that leads us through time, forward or back, but seldom in a straight line, most often spiraling. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I'm sitting here talking to you and you ask if I were okay, I'm okay in this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm okay trying to like talk loud enough for you to hear me yeah, that's on, good. On, on Zoom. <laughs> this is fine in the present moment. But yeah. when you ask in the present moment, if I were okay, suddenly I was back in San Francisco on Telegraph Hill crying over Archie, crying over Teddy here a month ago, suddenly all that welled up in me. So that, yeah. so that that is also present time, but it's 
but it's two years ago and a month ago. At the well, same I think time. that's why what you yeah. said about you know, the quote that you just gave us and then the way you structured the books is so powerful because it truly does represent what goes on in our brains. We don't think, we don't think straight chronological. Like you said, we, things pop up all the time. And that's why it's so powerful, I think, to write in the way that you do with time. When I think what I learned, there is a chapter in I Left on the Mountain about the Camino. And one of the things I learned about walking the Camino de Santiago de Compostelo is the, the ability to remain completely still in the moment. Uh huh. And all your feeling is forward motion. So this incongruity of stillness and forward motion is sort of the way I experience time. That's I mean, cool. It's in Congress thing, time is, I don't think time is, is a linear. Yeah. Time as a linear concept is how we as humans have had to cook, like codify it. Yeah. To understand. But, but it's cool. It, it's cool that your writing reflects, reflects that because we don't always see that. Now, when you talk about, you talked about the, that experience on the, on the Camino as you, as you were walking along and that sense of duality, the two things that kind of clash that don't apparently seem to go together, that seems to be a theme throughout. Certainly, I left it on the mountain. That the sacred uh, exists in the incongruous, that, yeah. that, that crux where the incongruous becomes an incongruity, that's yeah. where lies i mean that's that's the christian narrative that's every yeah. narrative. I mean, that is incongruity is the sacred narrative um, yeah so, yeah i believe and plus if you're i write about this a lot in mississippi sissy um if you are of a certain age and you grew up in the south in the 1960s you learn about duality really early if you have any sort of heightened awareness of the world around you. Mm -hmm. I was, I, you know, I was an orphan boy, a sissy boy. I was raised by grandparents out in the country who loved me unconditionally, saved my life, but they were racist. Yeah. They were racist. And so any objective view of them and a narrative that you're not a part of, you would maybe think they weren't good people because they said the N word a lot. They hated yeah rights workers and yet they saved my life and I had to find goodness in them. I had to find goodness in bad people really early on. Uh, so I know I, I learned that duality thing very, very early. And I think the way I had to learn to look at it is there's a there's a poet from Chelsea, in fact. Oh. Laura is her name, Laura Hisinski, with, I think. Yeah, I, yep wrote a poem called The Wall, where she overhears someone crying in the next motel room. I, 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 I want to come home, I want to come home. And she overhears this person crying, and then she dreams this sort of, like, goofy just dream, like underwater and stuff. So it's the simplicity of hearing the human cry. She has the dream, and she hears it through this wall that she, she describes as, Saw, made of sawdust and pink stuff. And when, when I first read that poem, I thought, well, am I the human cry? Or am I the person who overhears hears the cry and dreams this sort of vivid dream? And I couldn't decide, and then it dawned on me. No, you're the wall. You're the sawdust and the made of pink stuff. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. You are. You're the membrane that goes back and forth. So when you're in the zone of writing, you're neither this, nor that you're the sawdust and the pink stuff that it allows it to permeate and vibrate and exist. Yes. At one point, I can't remember which book, but you do explicitly talk about this, this, um, this distance that you feel as a writer, that you, um, that you watch things, that you kind of stand on the outside and you, and you lock it in. Can you talk about that a bit? I think every, um, every writer um, early on 
has the ability to be like as mm. I know that that's the way I survived as a excuse me as as a child um, because I I was the sorrow in my life I mean losing both parents within a year of that overwhelming sort of um, surreal sorrow. I think I was a little mad. I think I was a little crazy as, as a kid. And I think the only way I could survive that kind of sorrow was to see it as a narrative, to see myself as a character in some sort of narrative. Uh, I had to have that separate thing. And luckily, I always could write. So it just sort of, it clicked yeah. in. There's a, I, I, I noted this part. Okay, so this is, this is from I Left It on the Mountain. And this is page, uh, beginning, of, beginning of chapter two, The Climber. Um, I'm going to read your words to you. <laughs> I was okay. Um, it was not the make-believe quality of show business that attracted me. It was instead that one could exert such control over that make-believe. I would not only seek, out, seek it out, narrative in all its forms, but begin to look on my own life as narrative as well. Right. So that's why you can then take control by writing your own story, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah, I, I just thought that was so I powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's another question for you that somebody, somebody asked me to, to discuss with you, and that's the notion of truth and how much, as writers, um, we, need to, we, need to, we need to show the reader and how much we get to keep as secrets. Or how, or how much is true. I well, mean, that too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm thinking of... A, there's another Michigan writer, uh, Jim Jim Harrison, yeah. whose first book, a boss memoir. He, I mean, he just sort of like dared dared the the reader in a way. So, uh, in, in a strange way, I look at Mississippi Sissy, and I left it on the mountain as as uh, true novels, I guess. In a strange way, uh, the flip side of that. Because uh, I write them in a very not in a novelistic way. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I I confront that aspect of it because Mississippi Sissy came out around the same time as James Fry's um, what what was the name of his book that caused oh. all uh, a thousand little pieces or a million little pieces or yeah, I don't remember now. I want to say jagged little pill, but that's a whole. No, that's a no. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, it blew up, it blew up on, on on Oprah, so I had to, you know, I had to confront it here in this book. And and before we released this book, I was, my God, I was supposed to sign this to someone. Oops, 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 oops. <laughs> Hide that quick. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, what's what's this person? Name? Sorry, Pat Brennan. I was supposed to sign it. One of my biggest fans. I said, I'm so sorry, Pat Brennan. Oh my God. Well, they get a call out. Yeah. But I had to write an, 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 an author's note here and explain, you know, what, how I wrote this book. There's a, there's a book by a woman named, what can I have? I wrote this down. Lauren Slater. It's called Lying. And it's a memoir. But it's a, it's a metaphoric mem memoir where she talks about having epilepsy. She didn't have okay. epilepsy. She oh, was a convulsive as as a metaphor for the sort of convulsive self. She, she writes a completely um, false narrative to tell her own story. So it's it's a really it's a really interesting take on this. You know, um, George um, Bernard Shaw when he wrote his autobiography, he said, all autobiographies are lies. I don't mean unconscious, unintentional lies. I mean deliberate lies. So, I mean, for a long time, this, this um, 
topic has been out there. Like when oh, yeah. you, write, you write your own story, um, um, are you telling the truth? But um, yours feels, at least for the reader, it feels as if, because, because you discuss it, you openly talk about this in your memoirs. So for example, when you're interviewing Daniel Radcliffe, you, you apparently said to him something about, um, you know, the character that he wants to project, which is like, and you actually said Daniel's brother. So that's like the, the projection of Daniel, the famous projection. And um, the fact that you discuss this opening in your memoir makes it feel to the reader as if you're being extraordinarily truthful. It feels like so truthful at times, you know, that it's raw and it's hard to read. When, when my first book, okay, this is gonna be a bit of a long story, Good. right? Good, I shall settle in. Okay, so when Mr. B. Sissy came out, um, I sent a copy, a copy to um, Oprah because she, she had asked me to, to send her one, I sent her one. I didn't hear from her, I thought she hated it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So um, at one point, I start getting a phone call from unknown on, on, my, on my cell phone. And so I didn't, I didn't answer it. And, but it called all day one Saturday. And then one Sunday, I get up, I, I'm in my shower, I'm getting out of the shower, the phone rings, I pick up the phone. And it's unknown. I go, yeah, yeah, what? And I thought it was like gonna be some creep. And the voice said, Kevin. I went, yeah. She said, and she said, it's Oprah. I went, <laughs> what are you doing? Call me, woman. She said, I, I, she said, I said I was gonna call you when I read your book. And I said, well, I sent this book to you like six months ago. She said, you know, I'm a little busy. I went, okay, all right. She said, well, I finally read it. I would, I'd start to read, she said, honestly, I would start to read this book thinking I could skim it and then fake a phone call. No. And, and she, I would start to read it and I'd go, you know what? This is literature. I've got to really read this. But then I'd get busy and I couldn't do it, but it's been by my bed. So this weekend, before, you know, as I, as I was flying out here to Santa Barbara, I picked it up. I was going to start reading it on the plane. And I didn't put this book down until I finished it. We have to talk. And she said, and one of the things this book did was not only did it capture the way black people talk, because I was really worried about that, using black patois as a white guy. Um, she said, but I told Gail, I said, you got to read this book. This is how I remember white people talking when I was a little girl in Mississippi. Oh. It, that too. So that sort of gave me agency to have less guilt about that. So we really talked, she loved that book. We really talked about the book for about an hour. I sat, you know, air drying naked on the side of my tub, talking to Oprah about <laughs> the book. Um, and about Maddie May and um, the Maiden book and the complicity one feels at being molested. Uh, that's another thing that she really honed, honed in, in on yeah. in the book. How you live with you can you can forgive the person who molests you, but you have trouble forgiving yourself for being complicit in your own molestation. That you just live with it for the rest of your life. Well, you talk about that a lot in Spain, like searching for self-forgiveness. Love that book, right? So then fade out, fade in. I'm at an Oscar weekend out in Los Angeles. I'm at a party. Oprah comes and sits down next to me and we start to talk and I tell her about the second book and about my idea of spirituality and consciousness and uh, the Camino, blah, blah, blah. And then she stops me because, I mean, we've been talking for like half, half an hour. Right? And, she, and she says, you know what? Stop. This is a conversation I want to have on Super Soul Sunday. Mm -hmm. This is what we got on Super Soul Sunday. Well, I got all like, woo, woo, woo. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell a million books. And, blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and then I saw Gail the next night. She was like, I don't know what you know we're talking about. But she talks about you like the rest of the evening when, when we got home. She was like, oh my God, that conversation. I can't wait, wait to read this book. I never heard from her. I never was on Super Soul Sunday. I never heard from her about the book I sent her. Nothing. 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 Nothing, just blank. Fade out, fade in. I see her again at 
another Oscar weekend night. And he comes in, he comes into this picnic that that we all go to. And and Gail said, and I, and I was talking to Gail, and Gail said, oh, oh, Oprah's over there. Go say hi to Oprah. I went, be, be still, she'll come to us. So Gail and I stood, stood there talking. She came over. She grabbed my arm, said, Kevin, I hated your book. Oh. I was out of her mouth. <laughs> I went, well, I figured that out. <laughs> well, why didn't you call me and let me know, woman? I mean, you just left me hanging. She went, now look, you know how much I love Mississippi Sissy. I love that, that book. I, I, I said, I know. She went, but this one, she said, honey, this, this one was, this one was loud. It was just so loud. And I just, I couldn't, I know my audience and I, my audience could not deal with this book. Now, personally, I interpreted that as there's too much gay sex in it. That's what I heard because it was a spiritual book. That book was a spiritual journey, but there was really some rough, raw, drug taking sexuality in that book. And it was hard to read. I know some people had a hard time reading that book. So I, I listened to her talk about it. And I said, well, you know, Oprah, just this last week, I, I, I've, I've always said that if that book helps one person, if it helps one person, then that book was worth my writing it. And I said, and I was in a meeting, one of my meetings where I get sober, and this kid came up to me, said, and I, he had just, he was just starting to count days. So I went up to him afterward to introduce myself as we do. And he said, I'm gonna break your anonymity. I know who you are. I went, oh, okay. And he said, you wrote, I left it on the mountain. Uh -huh. I went, and he said, he said, I was in a bookstore with a friend of mine and his mother, and his mother handed me your book. Oh, I'm gonna cry here. Oh. I didn't know I was going to do this. And she, and she said, you need to read this book. This book will help you. And he said, I read your book, and your book is the reason I'm in this room. <sighs> so I, I told her that. I didn't cry. But I told her that. And I said, so it helped one person. So I have to, I have to be satisfied. I'm, I wasn't on, on your show. I didn't sell the books I wanted to sell but I helped that one person, so I have to own that. And she said, well, you know what, Kevin? She went, when I made Beloved, that film, that was the most important thing in my life. I really wanted that movie to be a huge hit. I wanted millions of people to see that movie. I wanted this movie to be a it bombed. That movie bombed. She said, and I was distraught, depressed, crying, and I was talking to, who's the guy that does all those books that's all of, like, Gary, somebody is like this new age person. Anyway, she's I was, I was talking to G Gary Zuko. I can't remember. But I was telling him all of this, and he said, "Oprah, I love that movie. That movie moved me before I ever knew you." He said that movie moved me. If that movie moved helped one person, that movie did its job. She said, "You know, you know what, Kevin? I thought about that." And I went, nah, that's not what I want. I want to help more than one person. So you're a better person than I am. <laughs> so that's it. You've got to decide, is it worth taking the audience into consideration or right. not? Right. Well, she has to. That's why she's Oprah. Yes. And I'm not. Yeah. No. But you've got to help that, that boy, that young person. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not just, it's not just, I think, I mean, you said, you know, there's the sex, there's the drugs that, I mean, at times they make it hard to read, but honestly, it's the, it's your, it's reading about your pain, I think, that makes it really hard. And that at the end makes the reader really root for you and be on your side. That's what makes it hard, I think. Although, you know, just this week, there was, there was some guy, I, 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 he's an acquaintance of mine. Mm. He writes every now and then, and he's wanted my friendship in a way I wasn't able to give him, I guess. I don't know. But, and when something like that happens, it can curdle into some sort of odd hatred and nastiness. 
So he wrote me this week about some column he'd written for Salon. And he wanted, I guess he wanted me to link to it on Facebook because I have a huge following and I just didn't. And then he wrote me how about something else. And then he talked to, then at the end, he talked about this book. And he said, yeah. you always supported your, your writing. But I tried to read that second book of yours. And honestly, I couldn't finish it. It was like, it, people, people can be so mean. Why are people, why are people mean? I don't understand meanness. I mean, I know how kind they can be because so much kindness has come my way during this Teddy illness and death. Mm -hmm. I like um, but people can be mean too. I just don't understand meanness. I don't understand it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Energy. Just, I don't understand. So the only time that for the reader it felt like you were holding you were holding some truth back, in to, to me at least, was when um, it was when you talked about your brother. You know, there was the whole chapter. I can't hear you. So again, very interesting because you're right. <laughs> yes. Well, you tell the reader, I can't, I can't talk about this. Well, when Mississippi Sissy came out, I made a very conscious choice not to write about my brother and sister in that book. They're barely in it. I mean, mm. they're they're mentioned in passing that I have a brother and sister because, as my brother said. When people would ask him about that book, well, he, that's his version. And because they they had a very different childhood than I had. We had the we had the same uh, setting, the same facts, the same trauma. Mm -hmm. They had a happy childhood. How much younger than than you is your brother? And my brother is two years younger, and my sister is four years younger. So mm -hmm. I was eight. And, and they were, you know, that much younger. And when, when I used to talk, when I used to go to a shrink, I would, you know, one of my greatest guilts was that I was never a big brother to them. I, mm -hmm. I, went to the, I went inside, I shut the door. They were outside playing all the time. I was inside in my bedroom, just alone. I just was alone. And mm -hmm. then I went to college early and then I moved to New York when I was 19. So I just sort of left. I just fled and sort of began to create my own life. And I would just complain about that I was never a big brother to them. And my shrink finally stopped me once. She said, you know, I don't talk much. And I said, I know. She went, but I've got to stop you here. She said, because I just can't hear this anymore. She wow. said, you were just old enough to get what happened to you. They didn't get it in the way that you got it. Mm -hmm. And you stood in the door that you finally shut. You stood in that doorway and you took it all for them. You just, oh, you're going to cry again. Sorry. You took it. You, you, you're like Oprah. <laughs> and, I, and you took it all. You just took it. So there is that aspect of I'm, I was still sort of taking it for them. I don't, they have their own story to tell. Mm -hmm. Each of us, your family, I'm sure your brothers and sisters, if you have them, I do. have a story to tell about your family than you do. Mm -hmm. So you still have to honor that. Because uh, my sister had such a happy childhood, but she just, she has, you know, they don't have any memories of my parents, none. They have none. I, I was just old enough to remember them. I have this vibrating presence of, of them. And, but there was one, one incident that my brother in the, in the funeral home, when he sees my mother in the casket and he loses it and sobs and sort of has this breakdown as a child. And I would talk to him in the past about that and he had no memory of it. Like, I don't remember that. And he read it in the book and for the first time, it all came back to him. Wow. Read it. He said, and he said, you know, you were right, it happened. I've suddenly remembered every bit of it. Oh. I mean, it's such a powerful passage for anybody. Wow. Yeah, but I'm very, I mean, they're very different people than I am. I mean, they're just so different. It's amazing mm -hmm. I can narrative and be such different characters. And just, they're very different people. Did you have to, 
<clears throat> I mean, apart from, you know, your, your direct family members, did you have to think about other people who you couldn't include? Or, I mean, you, it seems like you didn't change names, but how did you do that? My advice to anybody writing a memoir, write about dead people. <laughs> it's easy. Just look around you, figure out who's dead, make it about them. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And then what about, I mean, what about trying to make it relevant if, if people don't have these same crazy shared experiences? You know, I st it still seems to me if we've got that shared humanity, if we can find that, that kindness that you were talking about, it can still feel relevant. I mean, I don't, I've read books that I have nothing in common with that move mm -hmm. me. It's yeah. the right there. And, the, and plus, I like to be taken into worlds that I don't know about. So yeah. I mean, that's why I do read, you know, why I go to movies or, or you know, to be, have experiences that I don't have, so. Yeah. Are you gonna be able to write again? I hope so. I mean, there's a, one of the awful things about Facebook is you learn to write in like 500 and 600 word segments, like mm -hmm. a complete vignette thing. So you yeah. learn to write like that. So, um, you know, there's, there's, I have a couple of ideas right now that I think might be books. I, don't, I mean, I have to get in touch with the fact that I think of myself as a writer. I haven't been able to think of myself as a writer lately. I just have felt, I mean, even doing this, mm -hmm. you have to hear the buttons this pushes. Like, I was so nervous, I was so nervous about this. I feel like I'm not worthy of you talking to me about, oh. Because I, I know I can I know I can be entertaining, I can be clever, I can tell you a story about Oprah. But if you want to talk about, you know, the the the, the mechanics of writing or or you know the, or anything that's sort of academic about writing, oh my god, I freak out. <laughs> I, I don't think of myself as smart. I'm clever. That's how I think of myself. And I have a very uh, instinctive way of writing. I don't yeah. think of writing as an intellectual pursuit. When I get stuck, when I'm writing, when I'm blocked, I go back and I read like the two pages before and I don't read it for the ideas. I don't read it for the subject or, or the narrative. I'm listening to sounds, rhythm, assonance, alliteration, I'm listening to the music of language and what I hear from the sounds of the language is what pushes me forward. It's the, mu it's the music of the language. So yeah. it's not even words, it's notes. I hear the notes of the language and that's what gets me to keep going, to keep making that sound. I, I, I want to make the sound of language. I don't want to make, make you know, thoughts or subjects. I like the music of language. Uh, but you know, as a child of the South, we sit around as children, especially if you're a sissy, you sit around inside and you listen to grown ups talk. Yeah. And they talk in the South, they talk. And you wait for um, Miss, Miss, Miss Welty has a great image for it. You sit around and you wait for that one story to emerge like a mouse from its hole. You just, you just wait for it. You're just waiting for that mouse to peek out because you know there's going to be that one story and all these stories that will engage you. And that's the one that you sort of, oh, that's, that's what I could write about. It's, that's that's awesome. why you write because you hear. You hear in a different way. Right? I, think, I think there's a, a whole bunch of people who will find what you just said really inspiring. You know, if they're stuck or they don't know where, they don't even know where to start just get a couple of pages down and then read and kind of go with that rhythm and that flow that you found and, and keep that going and forget all that technical stuff. Don't think, don't think, mm -hmm. hear, feel, hear. It's, it's yeah. an impulse, it's, it's music. It's, I think it's really the way that people write music. Yeah, but then is there a point at which you've got to, or is this something for an editor to go back and really say, oh, well, maybe I need this particular device here, and you need to think in that kind of more 
scientific way? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I see, I, I can see movements. I go, well, you know, this, this should be, you know, a longer narrative and then here's something yeah. very easy to say. And this is, but that goes back to, to the time thing, I think. It's, a, it's hard to describe. I don't like to talk about it a lot because it's so idiot savant like. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I approach it. Well, it's uh, very, it's, it's very, it's, there's got a lot, there's a lot of motion. We've got the spirals, we've got all of the sounds and the rhythms and just kind of losing yourself in that sense. It, I mean, it should be a sensual experience writing, I think. And plus it's, you know, anytime you write anything, whether it's a book or a magazine article or a post on Facebook or whatever, you push, you push. It's like, oh, I can't do this. You push, and then all of a sudden, this thing you've created, this thing yeah, that grabs onto this and pulls the the story itself, the thing yeah. itself, develops this hand that reaches out and pulls you, and you just, oh my God, it, oh yeah, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. So it, it, there's a switch that happens at a certain point. And everything that you create, where you stop pushing and it pulls you. It so then to me, there's no doubt that you're going to be able to write again. I mean, you've got all of that in you. It's right okay. there. Well, thank you. Can you say some incantation or something? <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I would give you a, a sprig of hair, but that's not possible. Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and would you, what about, this, are you, you're not living in the South now, is that right? No, yeah, Hudson, New York. Um, I never thought I'd live in Hudson, New York. I don't, you know, I'd never been here until I arrived here. It's a town of 6,000 people, two, two hours outside of, of New York City. Um, so it's been interesting to be, I mean, I like small town life as long as I'm able to get out of it. So this is the first time I've stayed here more than two or three months because yeah. of the of the shelter in place i use it down in new york or i go to london for a month and um, yeah so this has been very interesting to be here I, I thought i'd be more productive and i'd write more than i've done it but my dog got sick so that's what i focused on and, um, yeah a close writer friend of mine who um lives by himself he is alone he doesn't have family and he has beloved cats and one of his cats got sick and he would have to take the cat to the emergency vet that's the only only place he left was to take the cat to the vet and the cat just died it's it's a terrible thing it's a grief like just no one knows that kind of grief that uh, when you lose a pet it's just yeah it's just all that all that grief gets lanced and yeah you know yeah i sob like i haven't sobbed since I don't know, I can't remember the last time I saw it. Gosh. Yeah, we have a very busy pet-filled home. Um, so I'm right there with you. So thank you so much for joining us, Kevin, and taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you for having me and, and taking the time to do this. And, yeah. uh, and I hope I said something that was interesting. And, and no, so many people are right there with you and wish you the very, very best. Congratulations. Thanks. And, and, and I talked a lot about dog grief and stuff, but this book really helped me. Oh, I just read I haven't read and, that yet. And it really helped. And it also involves a lot of what we talked about. Time, truth, a lot of, uh, it, it, this, I, this book ties into lots of what we talked about. So Excellent. I would like to give a shout out also. Perfect. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.